I'm Dr. Susan Chillinglaw. I am a professor of English at San Jose State University. And for 18 years, I directed the Center for Steinbeck Studies at San Jose State. And I'm presently on the board. I'm at the National Steinbeck Center, and I'm scholar in residence at the National Steinbeck Center. Joseph Campbell came to the peninsula in 1932. He was footloose and jobless, and he hitchhiked across the country to see Idell Budd among other reasons. He had met Carol Steinbeck's sister some years earlier on a trip to Hawaii, and they'd written back and forth and kind of flirted through letters. But Carol's sister, Idell, was recently engaged, and she certainly didn't want another young man hanging around. So she said, go meet my sister down in Monterey. You'll like her. So Campbell made his way down here to Carol and John's house in Pacific Grove in 1932. Steinbeck was working on To a God Unknown at the time. Carol was, you know, glad to see a, you know, a new fellow, a new chap stop by. Um, so John and Campbell immediately hit it off. They talked about King Arthur the first night, and Campbell loved King Arthur, and Steinbeck, it was one of his favorite books from his childhood. So they, Campbell had actually written his master's thesis on the dolorous stroke, and so they had this immediate kind of um, synergy. And they were both working on similar ideas at the time, well, different, certainly different aspects of it. But Steinbeck in writing To a God Unknown was looking, it was interested sort of in pantheism, how humans discovered their themselves and sort of spiritual values in nature. It's a very ambitious book. It's somewhat uneven, but it's very interesting. And so he was writing about a man named Joseph Wayne, who comes west, Right before his father, the patriarch of the family, dies, he believes his father's spirit resides in a tree, so he sort of worships the tree and talks to the tree. And then his brothers, who tend to be fairly rigid in their religious ideology, he wants to go beyond them and find re religion and spirit in nature, in the world. He visits Big Sur and somebody who sac sacrifices animals on the coast of Big Sur. It's a very strange and kind of very, but a very powerful and curious book. So he's working on that. Joseph Campbell is beginning his work on sort of the hero with a thousand faces. He, he's interested in the myths and stories of the world. So they start talking about, I mean, Steinbeck loved history. He read Herodotus, he read Greek mythology, he read Arthur. So they talk about all this. So Campbell's here a few months, and of course, he's brought into the Ricketts Steinbeck circle. And so they had this great sort of few months of energetic discussions and ideas and parties, not so many parties as everybody thinks because he wasn't here all that long. But they did have one great party where they, he got very drunk. I think that stands for many, many parties and <laughs> so but And Ricketts, of course, was writing his essay called Breaking Through which was about how human beings could break through momentarily from the physical to the metaphysical, rather like the romantic poets. Ricketts' favorite poet from very, at a very young age was Whitman. And so he read Walt Whitman, he liked Emerson and Thoreau, and it's all this sen the sensibility of finding spirit in, um, where, where one finds spirit, where one breaks through the ordinary to the extraordinary. So they're all really looking at similar things, how to, how to find links to human experience that are not about rational powers, but our imaginations and our spiritual powers. They also read Robinson Jeffers' poetry. Campbell kept very detailed notebooks, and so he writes in his notebook and in an interview that he did for the National Steinbeck Center about how Carol came in one day saying she had the key to the Rhone Stallion and read some lines about from the Lone Stallion about humanity is the crust to break through. So it's the same idea. She took, I'm sure that Jeffers took it from Melville about the pasteboard mass you have to, to break through to find the sort of the spirit beyond the physical. So they love Jeffers' poetry. 
And later on, Campbell quoted Jeffers' poetry in his drive all the way across country when he went back east. Steinbeck thought Jeffers should win the Nobel Prize, and he was very struck by his poetry. And Ricketts quotes Jeffers all throughout his private notebooks. So Jeffers was the catalyst for all of them and brought them together. None of them went to see Jeffers. None of them met him until later. Jeffers was reading Steinbeck. They were aware of one another. At least Una was reading Steinbeck, and Steinbeck was reading Jeffers, but they didn't actually meet, probably because Steinbeck respected Jeffers' privacy. Jeffers was a very private man. Steinbeck was a very private man and thought, if you were too much aware of your identity, you would not be able to write if you had a sense awareness of your own ego. Robinson Jeffers was a very interesting poet, certainly interesting to Steinbeck before Campbell came, before 1932 certainly. He read Jeffers because Jeffers was doing something similar to what he was doing, which was trying to describe place, first of all. And one thing he said was that Writing about place, which of course many writers do, place is not just a backdrop. It's not simply a, a setting for action that you think, okay, this is occurring in this particular place. But it informs how people live. And you have to see people as living in place, not dominating nature, but a part of the world they live. And the world not it means not only the flowers and the grasses and the the color of the sky and clouds, which Steinbeck is very good at evoking, but it's about, it's about natural forces, it's about the mountains that he so tellingly, you know, describes in something like the Red Pony and um, the contrast between evil and pastoral mountains. Um, so living in place for Steinbeck was all of these things, as well as the human environment and human history and past histories, the missions, etc. That was involved in a holistic understanding of place. So when he said, I was born to this place, my bones come from the limestone of these mountains, he felt that visceral connection to what it meant to live in place. He felt the same thing in Jeffers, that Jeffers was trying to articulate the same thing about the Big Sur, what it really meant to live in place. And this great sort of heroic and kind of tragic landscape, the rocks and the cliffs and the sea, the Jeffers sense that great dramas occurred there and that you had to see people in context of what that meant in terms of place. Jeffers has a notion that, I mean, that his verse dramas, which are so often so upsetting about, you know, these, you know, incest and the death and, you know, the Roan Stallion where California wants to copulate seemingly with the stallion. Well, it's not really clear whether she does or not, probably not, but I mean, there's that, so that urge to do something that transcends limits. That's what the whole landscape is about. It's kind of, you know, transcending human limits. And Jeffers looking at the sea, looking at the coast, looking at the rocks, pushes us out of, you know, the ordinary into the extraordinary in his poems, that, that human experience, when he talks about inhumanism, what he's saying is the humanistic tradition has taken us so, so far. When we keep lauding what people have done, what man has achieved, all our accomplishments, we're looking at man as the center of the universe. Inhumanism takes man out of the center and puts him, you know, within the context of the whole, of land, of place, of sea, of the infinite, of possibility, of, you know, he, he talks so much about the sea as our mother and time as, as infinite or universal. So really, he's, he's really asking readers to not be so human-centered, humanistic-centered, man-centered, human, and to look at the humans and the ecology of place. And that's exactly what Steinbeck was doing, too. So it was a very fruitful time, but it was short-lived, and short-lived in part because Campbell got involved with Carol Steinbeck a little too energetically. Um, they didn't consummate an affair. It was more a flirtation on Carol's part. It wasn't, I, I don't think on either part was it, you know, more than, and it was serious, but Carol was absolutely devoted to John, even though he tended to neglect her at times, and undoubtedly she loved the attention of this stranger in their midst, but she would have never have left John. He was absolutely devoted to him, and I think it made John realized how much he was devoted to her, and I think on Campbell's part, you know, he was 
you know, he was young. He was interested in anybody who sort of, I mean, he went up to Alaska with Ricketts after they left that summer of 1932. John and Campbell had a big fight and had an affair with one of the Kasavaroff's sisters, Richie and Tal Lovejoy, one of Tal's sisters. So it's not like he was deeply distressed. He kind of talked himself out of the affair, affair in words right as he went up to Alaska. I think that any time when you're young and you have really stimulating conversations and relationships, it influences you. I think you pick up bits and pieces from the people you know and meet and you're a part of everyone you meet. Um, certainly somebody like Ricketts I think got as much as from Jim Fitzgerald as he got from Steinbeck and I think Steinbeck got as much from Carroll as he got from Ricketts. So, you know, which influence was greater? People influences in different ways. I think that Campbell had been very well educated. He'd seen a lot. You know, he knew Krishnamurti. He'd, he'd written extensively on Arthur before he met Steinbeck. Carroll said that Campbell got more from John than John got from Campbell. So that may be true. Um, certainly John knew a lot and so maybe just conversing with somebody helps you clarify your own ideas. So I think it was seminal. I don't know, I'm sure that Campbell probably would have had the career that he did whether he met them or not, but I'm sure that it, it enriched him and clarified a lot of his thinking. And to find out that other people are concerned with the same things you are, I think is really exciting. Nobody was using the word ecology or holism or working on those same ideas. And so I think they were both on the cusp of some really quite revolutionary ideas and something that they were expressing and hadn't quite gotten to the point where they could express it clearly. So they were all kind of on the cusp of trying to articulate these notions.